The Canon EOS Rebel G is a pretty useful beginner-friendly film SLR camera, and in this video we'll be taking a look at how to set one of these cameras up and also learn how to use some of its inbuilt features to assist you with your photography. Let us learn how to set up one of these cameras. Besides having the camera body, you're going to need a few additional materials. You will need a Canon EF mount lens, you will also need two CR123A batteries, and finally you will need some film to load into the camera. To load batteries into the camera, first take a look at the bottom of the film camera's body. There should be a latch door that is where the batteries are supposed to be going. Unlatch this door and you will see that there is a diagram that shows you exactly how the batteries are to be inserted. Positive end sticking up on the left battery and negative end sticking up on the right battery. Once you close the door, you should be able to turn the command dial, which is the dial located towards the left of the camera, to any setting other than the red color L. A full battery indicator should be printed on the LCD display on the right of the camera. If the battery display is only half filled or if none appears at all, this means that there is a fault with the batteries that you have inserted, in which case you are going to have to replace the batteries again. Let us now learn how to mount a lens onto the camera's body. Remove the body cap protecting the camera's body by twisting it counterclockwise. Next, remove the bottom protective cover that is present on any Canon EF mount lens. Align the red dot that is present on the lens body onto the camera's body. Then simply twist it clockwise until you hear and feel a click. To ensure that the lens can work in autofocus mode, simply switch the autofocus switch to the AF position. If you would like to dismount the lens, simply press the lens release button located on the camera's body and twist the lens counterclockwise. To protect the camera's body, simply place back the body cap onto the camera by twisting it clockwise or you can mount another lens onto the camera's body. Let us now add film into this particular camera. To unlatch the film cover door, you simply find the latch that's located on the left of the camera's body, below the command dial. Push this latch upwards and you can now swing open the camera, revealing the film transport mechanism. You can use any sort of 35mm film from color negative films to slide films to even black and white films. The only film you cannot use are infrared films. At the back of the camera, you can now see where the film canister is supposed to go, the shutter curtain of the camera, and also the film take-up spool. Do not touch the shutter curtain as this will damage it. Place your film canister on the left of the film transport mechanism, then simply pull the film leader until you reach the orange color indicator located on the right of the film transport mechanism. Now, close your camera door and you should hear that the camera will begin to load up the film once you set the command down to any other location other than the red color L. The numbers will count up to 37 and then will go back down to 36 if you are using a film that contains 36 exposures. The ISO setting is automatically set by the DX codes present on most film canisters. However, if you would like to override this particular setting, or if you are using films that do not contain any DX encoding systems, you can simply turn the command dial to the ISO indicator located over here. Then simply turn the main dial left and right until you select an ISO that suits your needs. In most cases, you can simply set the ones that is printed on the film box. Then turn the dial to any other setting and the camera would memorize the ISO settings that you have set. The viewfinder is this rectangular window that is located at the back of the Canon EOS Rebel G. And you use the viewfinder to compose your picture and figure out what the camera is seeing at the moment in time. Let's take a look through the viewfinder to see what is present. Taking a look through the viewfinder, you see that there is a main rectangular section. This is the viewfinder screen and it displays exactly what the camera is going to capture when the shutter button is pressed. You will also notice that there are several things that are also printed on the viewfinder screens that will not actually reappear on your photos. There is this circle over here which represents the partial AE metering section. We will cover partial metering when we get to a later part of the video. There are also three rectangles that are located on the left, middle and right of the viewfinder screen. These are the autofocus points present in the camera and the camera can use either one or multiple autofocus points when achieving focus when the photo is taken. When you turn the command dial to any other setting other than the red color L and half press the shutter button, you can see that there are several things that are lit up on the green screen below the main viewfinder screen. We will now cover through exactly what these settings are. 
This green color display shows you exactly what the camera settings is going to be used for capturing the picture. Starting from the left, we will see a green color lightning bolt. If you see the green color lightning bolt, this indicates that flash will be used for the photo. And if you don't see it, it means that no flash will be used for the picture. The number beside the green color bolt is known as the shutter speed. The shutter speed is represented in reciprocal. In other words, if you see a 20, it indicates that the shutter speed will be 1 20th of a second. If you see that the number is accompanied with a quotation mark such as 4 quotation mark, this indicates that 4 seconds will be used, and the shutter speed will determine exactly how fast the shutter curtain will make its traversal from the film plane. The number beside it you will see is the aperture value, or f-stop number. A larger number will represent that the lens will close down smaller, while a smaller number will indicate that the lens will open up bigger. Next to it, you will see that there is a rectangle with three points. These points represent which autofocus points is currently being used by the camera to achieve proper focus. Beside it, you may see a scale, which is the metering scale used by the camera, and we'll cover exactly what this does in a later portion. And finally, the green color circle you see over here represents the autofocus indicator. A solid green color indicates that the camera has achieved proper autofocus, while a blinking indicator means that the camera is unable to achieve autofocus. If this happens to you, the camera will be unable to fire a shot. If you would like to focus in difficult to focus situation where the autofocus system fails to achieve focus, simply set your switch to the M position on your autofocus lens and turn the manual focusing ring until desired focus is achieved through the viewfinder. Some of the settings presented on the green color screen is also printed directly on the LCD display located at the top right of the camera body. The simplest way to use this particular camera is in the full auto mode. The full auto mode essentially turns your camera into a simple point and shoot style of camera. All you need to concern yourself with is to compose your pictures and then after that fire away once autofocus has been achieved. You don't need to concern yourself with what shutter speed to use, what aperture to use or even whether a flash is going to be used or not. All these settings are automatically calculated by the camera. To use the full auto mode, simply turn the command down to the green color rectangle symbol. Next, compose your image using the viewfinder screen and once you have achieved your composition, half press the shutter button. You will see that the camera will achieve autofocus automatically for you. And if you're happy with the settings that is presented and you're happy with how the picture looks through the viewfinder, fully depress the shutter button. The camera will capture the image according to the settings shown and the film will be wound to the next frame so that you can begin taking pictures again. If you would like a more audible sort of autofocus indicator, you can activate this using the function keys. Press the function keys located at the top right of the camera body until you see that the arrow points to this particular symbol. Next, turn the main dial until you see the number 1 appear on your screen. You will now see that whenever the camera achieves autofocus, you can hear an audible beep noise that is generated by the camera. If you would like to reverse this process, you can simply do a similar function by pressing the function key until the arrow points to the symbol, then turning the main down to the zero position to deactivate this audible setting. The program image control zones aim to make photography a little bit easier for beginners, and this is the section that we will cover first. Essentially, the idea of using the program image control zone is as such. You as the photographer figure out what sort of pictures that you would like to take. Then what you need to do is select the corresponding modes on the command dial. The camera will then decide all the calculations and other modes for you based on what type of photos that you would like to take. Let's start off by taking a look at the first mode that's on the command dial, which is known as the portrait mode. And the symbol is represented by a side view profile of a person's head. The portrait mode, as its name implies, is useful for taking pictures of portraits. If you have ever used your smartphone's portrait mode, it works in a similar fashion. Essentially, when you take a picture using this particular mode, you will see that the person's face will appear in focus, but the background and surroundings will appear very nicely blurred out. To use this particular mode, simply turn the command down to the portrait mode. Next, once you have turned the command down to the portrait mode, begin to compose using the viewfinder. Half press the shutter button in order for it to autofocus on a person's face. Then when you are happy with the settings, simply push the camera button all the way down to capture the image. Sometimes flash may be used when taking these portrait shots. And usually flash is used if the environment is either too dark or 
if the subject is located in an area where the backlight is usually brighter than the subject's face. In this case, this is known as fill-in flash, where the flash is trying to brighten the subject so that it looks about as bright as the surrounding background. Occasionally, when you use flash, especially in dark environments, you may experience this effect known as red eye effects. The subject's eyes will appear red in color. To reduce this chance of this happening, this camera actually has a red eye reduction effect that is built into the camera. To be able to activate this particular function, simply press the function button until there you can see an arrow pointing to an eye symbol like this. Then what happens is that you just have to turn the main dial until the number 1 appears. Then simply press any of the buttons such as the shutter button and you should see that now the function of the red eye reduction is activated. This function simply turns on the LED located at the front of the camera so that there's some bright light shining on the person's face. And this allows for the pupils to be able to constrict so that when the flash is actually used, the red eye effect is actually minimized. One tip for using this portrait mode is if you own one of the lenses uh, offered by Canon, such as the default 35 to 80 millimeter lens, it is recommended to use somewhere within the telephoto range of around 80 to around 135 millimeters. This is because if you use the lens in this particular focal length range, you will see that one, you will be able to minimize facial distortion caused by wide angle lenses. And the second thing is that it will put enough distance between you and the subject so that you, the subject can feel a bit more comfortable instead of having the cameras very close to the subject's face. When using the portrait mode, you do not have to hold your camera in a portrait orientation. This mode also works when the camera is held in the landscape orientation. The next mode we would like to cover is the landscape mode. The landscape mode, as its name implies, allows for the camera to be able to take nice landscapes. Typically, the camera would be able to prioritize focusing on far away subjects, and they will try to pick settings that allows for a large amount of things to appear in focus when the camera is going to take the picture. As usual, to use this mode, simply turn the command down to this particular symbol over here, which shows the mountain and the clouds. Then what you simply have to do is to point towards your subject or the landscape that you would like to take a photo of, half press to achieve autofocus, then when you're satisfied with the setting, just fully depress the shutter button to capture the picture. Occasionally, if you do see the shutter speed indicator blink, this indicates that the scenery may be a bit too dark for the camera to capture. In this case, it is recommended to place it on the tripod to minimize camera shake and then take the picture again. When using the landscape mode, especially when paired with the default 35 to 80 mm lens, it is recommended to set it around the wide angle range of lesser than 50 mm. This allows the lens to be able to widen its field of view, which will allow you to capture more things in the landscape. The next mode that we will be talking about would be known as the close up or macro mode. This mode allows the camera to be able to assist you with taking pictures of close-up subjects. Essentially, the autofocus would prioritize focusing on closer subjects as uh, compared to the rest of the modes. To use this mode, simply set the command down to the flower symbol. Then all you have to do is approach closely to the subject that you would like to take. Next, half press the shutter button and you will see that the camera will focus on the subject up close. If you would like, you can now begin to move closer and closer to the subject until you achieve the desired magnification on your viewfinder. Of course, there is a limit to how close you can get to the subject as every lens has a minimum focusing distance. When you are satisfied with the look of the photo that will appear, you can simply fully press the shutter button and the camera will take the picture for you. Occasionally, flash may be used for this particular photo taking mode. If you would like to achieve the largest magnification ratio in a zoom lens, it is recommended to set the lens to the largest focal length that you can sustain. In my case, since I'm using a 35 to 80 millimeter lens, I simply have to set the lens to the 80 millimeter mode, and you can see that as compared to the 35 millimeter focal length of this zoom lens, I can achieve a larger magnification and I'm able to make the subject appear larger on the viewfinder screen and on the final photo. Of course, you do not have to always set the lens to the highest focal length. It is up to you as a photographer to decide what focal length you would like to use, keeping in mind the magnification ratio that is possible to achieve depending on which focal length the zoom lens is set. If you would like to do better macro photography or you would like to pursue this, you may want to invest in macro lenses in the EF uh, series, which Canon has uh, released quite a few, or you can also invest in the macro flash units that allows you to be able to illuminate close-up subjects better than the built-in flash on this particular camera. 
The next mode that we will talk about is known as the sports mode. The sports mode essentially is represented by this running man figure over here. In this mode, the camera will prioritize using a faster shutter speed when capturing images. To use the sports mode, simply turn the command down to this running man symbol over here. And what you simply have to do is to compose your shot, half press the shutter button in order for the camera's autofocus to focus on the moving subject, then fully depress the shutter button when you're ready to capture an image. If you do see that the shutter speed indicator blinks, the camera is actually warning you that this may cause motion blur as the environment may be too dark for a fast shutter speed to be used. In sports modes, usually flash is not used at all throughout the entire shooting experience. So if you are in very dark environments, it's recommended for you to either use a film that is more sensitive or simply to brighten the environment. The sport mode also allows your camera to be able to capture several photos in quick succession. If you would like to take a continuous stream of photos, what you simply have to do is continuously hold down the shutter button once the first photo has been taken. The camera will automatically capture and wind to the next frame as multiple focus photos are being taken. The last mode that I would like to discuss is known as the night portrait mode. The night portrait mode, as its name implies, is useful for taking night portraits where you would like the subject to appear properly illuminated while having the background information also being recorded. In other words, you can see both the person in the nighttime scene and you can also see where the person is at the moment in time when the photo is taken. When using this night portrait mode, it is recommended to put the camera on a tripod or a place that is stable as the camera will use a slower shutter speed. To use the night photography mode, this is what you need to do. Simply turn the command down to this particular symbol over here. Next, place your camera on a tripod. The next step is to ask your subject to position themselves in front of the camera, then half press the shutter button to ensure that they are in focus. When the photo is ready to be taken, remind your subject not to move even after you see the flash fire. Fully depress the shutter button. What you will see is that the flash would fire to illuminate the subject and at the same time you will notice that the camera takes a longer time than usual to be able to capture the image. Before we learn how to use the creative zones that's available on the command dial of this particular camera, we will need to learn a little bit more about the exposure triangle. The exposure triangle essentially are the three main basic settings that affects the way pictures are seen in all cameras today. There is the ISO, which represents how sensitive the film is to light, and there is also the shutter speed, which represents how fast the shutter curtain moves across the film plane, and the aperture, which is the size of the lens opening that will be used when the picture is taken. All these three settings usually would affect the way the picture would look in the end. The ISO it is the main setting that does not change in the film camera. When you load film into a film camera, the ISO or how sensitive the film is to light is a chemical property of the film. Therefore, changing the ISO on the film camera does not change the chemical property of the film. It only changes the way the camera calculates its exposure settings. You could change the ISO on the film camera if you would like to perform certain techniques such as over and under exposing films on purpose because you would like to achieve things such as push or pulling of film. However, usually for ISO in film, once you have set the ISO settings on the film camera, you do not touch it at all. The only two other settings that you are left to play around with is the shutter speed and the aperture settings. If you do not wish to bother with adjusting the aperture or shutter speed when you're taking pictures, you can use the program mode which is demarcated by the letter P on the command dial. The program mode essentially allows the camera to decide for you both the shutter speed and aperture without your input. Simply position your camera using the viewfinder to compose, then half press the shutter button and you will see that the camera will automatically select a shutter speed and aperture setting that is printed both at the green color screen located at the bottom of the viewfinder screen and also located on the LCD at the top of the camera. If you do not wish to use these particular settings, you can choose to change the shutter speed and aperture pairing. Turning the main dial, you can see that the camera will cycle through various shutter speed and aperture pairing. All of these pairings are actually equivalent in a sense that the same amount of light will enter the camera. You can think of it like selecting how fast you should run and how long you should take in order to run a marathon. You can perhaps maybe run at 1 km per hour for 10 hours, or you can choose to run at 2 km per hour for 5 hours. Both of these will achieve the same distance that you travel, which is about 10 km. 
The difference between the program mode and the full auto mode is that unlike in the full auto mode, in the program mode, you can decide as a photographer whether or not you would like to use flash in your pictures. If you would like to use flash in your pictures, simply press the lightning bolt button located near the lens barrel of the camera. You will see that the flash will pop out and when you half press the shutter button, this time the camera will calculate for you the necessary settings, keeping in mind that flash will be used. When you fully depress the shutter button, the flash will fire and you will get an image that has been exposed properly with flash. If you do not wish to use the flash, you can simply push down the flash back into the camera body and the camera will behave as per normal. Sometimes you may encounter a situation where the camera has difficulty autofocusing with the three autofocus points. If you would like to override the camera's decision and just choose one single autofocus point, you can simply use this button over here to select which autofocus point you want the camera to use. Once you've selected the autofocus points, now when you half press the shutter button, only that particular autofocus point is used by the camera in order to be able to achieve proper focus. The next mode that we will cover is known as the shutter priority mode. The shutter priority mode is represented by this TV symbol on the command dial. In this particular mode, you simply select the shutter speed and the camera will automatically calculate for you the aperture as necessary. This is very similar to your elementary school or primary school sort of mathematics problems where if you know the speed and you know the distance traveled, you will be able to calculate the time based on mathematics. To use this mode, simply set the camera to the TV setting by turning the command dial. Then what you need to do is to use the main dial to select your shutter speed. The shutter speed that the camera is going to be using will be printed on the LCD display located at the top of the camera. Now you simply have to compose your shot and then half press the shutter button. And you will see that the camera will automatically select for you an aperture setting based on the shutter speed. If you notice any of the numbers are blinking, this indicates either the camera thinks that the scene is too bright or too dark for a proper picture to be taken. When this happens, you simply have to readjust the shutter speed as necessary until you notice that the numbers do not blink. When you are happy with the settings, you can fully depress the shutter button to take your pictures. The reason why you will want to use shutter priority mode is usually to manage the amount of motion blur that is present in the camera. If you select a high shutter speed, you will notice that the camera tends to freeze motion in action. If you select a low shutter speed, you will realize that the camera tends to cause the motion to be captured and be blurred. Which photo is the better photo? Well, there is no right answer. It's actually up to you as a photographer to determine what sort of picture you would like to capture. Whether you want to freeze motion with a fast shutter speed or whether you want to allow the motion to be blurred out with a slow shutter speed. The next mode we will cover is known as the aperture priority mode and is the, represented by the AV letter that is printed on the command dial. When you use the aperture priority mode, you simply turn the command dial to the AV setting. And then what you will see is that when you turn the main dial, you will now see that instead of changing the shutter speed, it is now changing the aperture setting used by the camera. Once you've selected the proper aperture setting, you can half press the shutter button to achieve autofocus and see what shutter speed it recommends. If you're happy with the settings and none of the numbers are blinking, you can proceed to fully press the shutter button in order to be able to capture your pictures. The numbers printed for the aperture setting actually are reciprocal numbers. This is why you notice that if let's say you select a smaller number such as f4, you will see that the lens actually opens up wider. And if you select a number that is larger, for example f16, you will see that the lens goes smaller. This backwards sort of logic is due to the fact that the numbers are actually fractions rather than actual whole numbers. The reason why you would like to use aperture priority for your picture taking is because you would like to control the amount of depth of field in your pictures. To illustrate this point, I have taken a picture of this particular pillar where I have caused the lens to perfectly focus at the edge of the pillar. When I select a smaller f-stop number, you can see that anything that is located too close or too far away from this particular edge of the pillar would appear out of focus and blurry. But if I increase the f-stop number to a larger value, you can see that now almost everything appears relatively in focus in the picture. Which setting to use is again up to your personal preference as a photographer. Usually you will use the larger f-stop numbers if you would like to capture, for example, landscapes because you want the depth of field to be large so that you'll be able to ensure that everything is in focus. You will select a smaller f-stop number to allow for a shallow depth of field for things such as portrait or product photography where perhaps you would like the human subject to be the main focus and you would like to blur out everything to isolate the subject in your pictures. The last setting to use is the manual mode and is marked by the letter M on the command dial. 
in the manual mode, essentially the photographer would decide both the shutter speed and aperture to be used for the pictures. The metering scale, instead of pointing to zero, will now begin to move around left or right, depending on what combination of shutter speed and aperture that you use. Turning the main dial will adjust the shutter speed, and turning the main dial while pressing and holding down the AV plus minus key would adjust the aperture. As a photographer, usually you just begin to turn these dials to select the shutter speed and aperture pairing until you notice that the metering scale points to the zero position. When you notice that the metering scale points to the zero position, it means that to the camera's eye, this photo will be most likely be properly exposed, not too bright, not too dark. You can now half press the shutter button to achieve autofocus, then fully depress it to capture your image. The Canon EOS Rebel G also contains several more advanced features. One of them is known as the auto exposure bracketing. Auto exposure bracketing essentially allows your cameras to take three different shots in different metering situations so that you will be able to select later which photos you prefer. Usually, the photos would be taken is as such, one will be perfectly exposed, one will be underexposed, and one will be overexposed. To set auto exposure bracketing, simply press the function button until you realize the arrow points to this particular symbol. Next, turn the main dial and you will see that there is a bracket that is forming in the metering scale, where the three arrows will represent how far underexposed, overexposed, and correctly exposed the pictures will be taken. The number on the LCD display also indicates what is the auto exposure bracketing size. Over here, I've simply set the brackets to its largest size, which is that you will under and overexpose pictures by two stops. When you're done setting it up, your camera will now perform auto exposure bracketing at the next three pictures that you take. Here, I'm going to take a picture of this particular corridor over here, and you will notice that when I half press the shutter button, at first the meter points to the zero position to indicate that it's going to take a perfectly exposed picture. The next time I press the shutter button, you will see that the meter now points to the minus 2 direction, which indicates to me that the picture is going to be underexposed. Likewise, my third picture will be overexposed by the indication on the metering scale. These are the three pictures that are finally produced by this particular process. You can see that in the underexposed pictures, I can see more of the details in the sky and bright areas, but details in the shadow is completely lost. Likewise, in the overexposed pictures, the bright sky uh, settings have now completely been washed out, but you can see that there's more details in the shadow that is now appearing. Which of these three pictures you will want to use is entirely up to you as the photographer to decide. Sometimes you may even use uh, software to be able to combine these three pictures together to be able to get all the details in both the highlights and the shadows of the images. This camera can also perform a technique known as exposure compensation. To use exposure compensation with this particular camera, what you simply have to do is set the command dial to the P, TV, or AV modes. Then, hold down the AV button, uh, which is located at the back of the camera, and turn the main dial. You will see that the metering scale, instead of pointing towards the zero position, the needle now moves towards the left or the right of the scale, depending on which direction you turn the main dial. When you now begin to take your picture, you will see that the metering scale present on the green color LCD display in the viewfinder will show you exactly how much over and under exposure that the camera would apply. Fully depress the shutter button to confirm your settings. You can also use this setting in combination with the auto exposure bracketing. When you do this, when you turn the main dial while holding down the AV button, you will see the entire bracket shift left and right. Another metering mode you can use on this camera is known as the partial AE metering mode. This camera usually uses the evaluative metering mode by default. However, if you would like to use partial metering, for example, if you are taking pictures in very high contrast scenarios, you can perform the following action. The partial metering area is represented by the circle that's printed on the viewfinder screen. Therefore, whatever object that this circle surrounds at, the camera would perform partial AE metering and expose that area to a medium gray. If you would like to perform this action, simply compose your shot such that this particular circle is covering whichever area you would like to partially meter for, then simply press the asterisk key that is located at the back of the camera. The camera will now memorize this particular metered reading. You can now recompose and then simply capture your image. Whatever that contains the same amount of brightness that was surrounded by the circle at the moment when the asterisk symbol was pressed would be exposed to a medium gray in your final picture. One other mode that is available on this particular camera is known as the automatic depth of field mode. Essentially, in this mode, the camera uses all three autofocus points to determine which is the furthest and which is the closest subject that is in front of the camera. 
the camera from these particular distances will be able to calculate which aperture to use so that everything between the furthest and the closest points will be able to be captured in focus. It is useful for group settings or group pictures when everyone is sort of crowded around the camera and that it will be covered by the three autofocus points. Although for me, I don't really like using this particular mode as I find that the settings that I use when using this particular mode tends to jump around and give me very random different settings. Nevertheless, from my experience, the automatic depth of field mode tends to be able to still produce decent pictures where the subjects covered by the three autofocus points are still maintained relatively in focus. There's also another specialized mode that you can use with this camera and that is known as multiple exposure mode. Essentially, you can think about it as overlapping two or more images together into one single picture. To activate this particular function, simply press the function key until you notice that the arrow points to this particular symbol over here. Now, turn the main dial until you notice that the numbers begin to increment from 1 up to any other higher number. 1 would represent normal shooting, while 2 and higher numbers up to 9 represents that the camera will overlap that many photos into one single frame. Here, I've set it to the position number 2, and I begin to take two different pictures together. You can see that the final image results in these two pictures overlapping with one another to generate this composite image. Lastly, we have the self-timer that is built into the camera, and it is very useful for things such as self-portraits or if you would like to minimize vibrations in the camera. Press the self-timer button, and you will see that the self-timer symbol appears on the LCD display. Now, you can simply mount your camera on a tripod or a stable surface, and then half press and fully depress the shutter button to be able to take your picture. The camera will begin to count down from 10 seconds, and once the 10 seconds have subsided, the camera will automatically take the pictures for you. This camera is able to automatically detect when a film has completely been used up. Once the canister has run out of exposures, the camera will simply automatically rewind the film for you so that you can remove it from the camera. If, however, you need to remove the film out of the camera prematurely, what you simply have to do is to turn the command down to the film rewind symbol located over here. Now, press the self-timer button to confirm your action and you will notice that the film will be rewound automatically into the canister. There's also a large array of different accessories that you can use with this particular camera to change the way that the camera operates. One of them is the lens. This camera uses the Canon EF series of lenses and there's plenty of selection from both the old times and present day that you can use with this particular camera. You could perhaps choose to mount one of these lenses that I have over here, which is a Canon EF 40mm pancake lens. And when you mount it on this particular camera, you now have a very lightweight and easy to use setup that is useful for travel photography. You can also choose to perhaps purchase wide-angle lenses that allows you to be able to see more of the scenery. You could also purchase telephoto lenses that works similarly to a telescope, where you can now use your cameras to see things that are far away. Useful for things such as portrait photography or for even larger telephoto lenses, you can use it to capture nature and wildlife from a distance. You could also choose to purchase some of Canon L series of zoom lenses, which have a very nice selection of focal lengths to be able to be swapped on the fly, while at the same time having a very nice and large aperture to be able to allow you to achieve certain effects where you would like subject isolation when taking pictures. These lenses also include certain special features such as image stabilization that allows you to be able to handhold your camera and take pictures in darker environments without worrying too much about vibration being captured in the pictures. To figure out which lens is right for you, you can take a look at some of the online reviews as to how these lens performs in certain situations or take a look at some of the videos online that reviews all these lenses and how they perform. Other accessories that you can buy for this camera includes special flash units such as this one. And these flash units usually are more advanced than the ones that's built into your camera. They allow you to be able to perform techniques such as bounce flash that allows you to be able to illuminate subjects without very harsh lighting. Other accessories that you can purchase for your camera includes perhaps maybe a cable release to be able to release the shutter curtain without having to touch the camera or even perhaps specialized grips that allow you to be able to hold the camera in a better position. This concludes our guided tour on how to use the Canon EOS Rebel G. I do hope that this video will serve as a useful guide for you in your photographic journey. If you have any questions or you'd like to provide any feedback, do leave them in the comments below and I'll try my best to answer them when I have the time. Thank you so much for your kind attention and I do hope to see you again soon.